name's Oliver. You can tell from my accent, I'm British. Um, I've been living in Porto, though, since uh, that majestic decision of my compatriots to leave the European Union. i am almost got my European passport back. Five years. Um, hopefully, Portuguese bureaucracy will see me through to my, uh, to my passport. Um, it's great to see so many people here. It's obviously a topic that is of interest. Uh, but at the same time, the fact that there's so many of you, I suspect it's, an, it's, a, it's a topic that we're not too sure about. You know, there's confusion about what is sustainability, how do we apply it, all those kind of things that were you to join the uh, executive program, you would learn. So what are we going to do in the next 50 minutes or so that we've got? Um, uh, I'm going to set some context. I'm going to present some uh, some. Uh, different versions of sustainability. I'm going to show how those are applied in practice, and I'm going to ask you a few questions. I'm going to invite you to be engaged. Um, I am going to have try and if we leave in 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 50 minutes with three things: uh, deco sustainability's five faces. You might wonder about the Medusa idea. It wasn't just that I like the picture. It's quite interesting. All the pictures of Medusa, she's really beautiful. But the one thing, there's two things about her. One is that she has these snakes in her hair with their different faces. That was the idea of sustainability being quite confusing and going off in different directions, and it's difficult to understand exactly what it is. But she's also known as being really beautiful. But the one thing we know about her is that she was deadly ugly. And if you were to look at her, you would die. Um, but I'm suggesting there are, there are five, those snakes, there's five, at least five faces. I'll call five faces of sustainability. So at the end of 50 minutes, if we can come out of here knowing what they are, how they differ, and why they matter, then, um, then I think we've, we've, we've succeeded. But a few questions to get an idea of who who you are in the audience. Who was taught sustainability at school? One at the front, a couple out there. Who was taught at university? A few more. So my statistic, C, your generation Z. <laughs> Basically, this is such a hot new topic that anyone, you know, beyond whatever you're after, generation Z, you probably, w it, it's so new, it's everywhere, but it's a really new phenomenon. Um, second question, who trusts leaders to do the right thing? Any leader? Do you trust your leaders? Actually, that's a really bad question at the moment in Portugal, isn't it, with the government? Who trusts business? Who trusts business leaders? Come on, it's a business school. Someone's, I, I thought I'd have more hands. Don't be shy. Can't you? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's why you're here. But even the business leaders don't put their hands up. Uh, do we trust government leaders? Do we trust media? Not one hand. Uh, very wise. So 49% of people say they trust business, 42% government, and 35% us. That's the Edelman Trust Barometer. Who believes business is a force for good? Good. Yeah, a few more. But there are a few, few no's as well. Don't be shy. Put your hand up for a no. Why don't... Why, I'd be interested. Does anyone want to tell me why do you think it, it, it isn't it isn't or it can't be uh, a force for good. Yeah. Shareholders. That's you know, one basic answer, right? Yeah. So C, 63%. No, 37%. That's an American survey. That's an important factor. That. What's the context in this whole debate? We talked about the, the we were presented with the program. If you were to join it, you would learn the to all the tools and the resources and the strategies, and you'd come out being a sustainability manager that can roll this out in their company. All terrific. But what is the wider context in which this discussion is happening? Why are people interested in it? Why is sustainability such a hot topic? Who knows the word spin? Do you know what I mean? It was in the title, but do you know what? It's a very it's, it's a, we use it in a very British context. I think it happened with the Blair government. Spin-off? No, but I can see why in a business school you, you'd think... Bit. <laughs> Turning the message around, exactly. So you've got a story, twist it, spin. You're a spin doctor if you're very good at that, or a journalist. Um, so we, we all followed the COP. Some will be happy about it, some will be sad about it, but the UEA certainly were happy about it, weren't they? We got a loss and damage fund. We managed to get fossil fuels mentioned in the text, okay? No obligation, no, not binding, but we mentioned it. So we can all be happy and clap each other. What's the reality? Last year was the hottest year on record. 
The last 10 years have been the hottest 10 years on record. We're living in a climate emergency. COP15, who knows what COP15, not COP28, COP15, this is the nature one. It's when they get excited about saving the oceans and saving the, the rainforests. Uh, and again, they're very, very keen. This happened um, in Montreal last year. The next one will be in China. Uh, they had this 30 times 30 commitment. It's brilliant. On paper, it looks great. We're going to preserve 30% of land mass and oceans by 2030. We should clap ourselves on the back, but what's the reality? We're living in a nature crisis. Deforestation, uh, animal extinction, it's bad out there. Uh, and Davos, who's been following Davos? You've all been following Davos, your business people. You get excited about watching those CEOs in their duffel coats, breathing all that, that air. Zelensky was there talking about Ukraine. The US are going to save the, the, the trade routes and, and kick the arse of those Yemenis. You know, all inflation, we're going to battle it. All positive news. But what's the, the other side? There's a brilliant... Oh, it's brilliant, but you know, it's Oxfam stuff. You all know Oxfam, anti poverty charity, came out with a report this week about the inequality gap. It's growing, guys. It's not getting smaller. Whatever they say in Davos, there might be global growth. There's no global growth, but if there were, it doesn't play out equally around the world. So, one of the stats in there the five richest men, they're always men, right? Five richest men have doubled their wealth since 2020. Warren Buffett. Mr. Musk, all that lot. Uh, the other stat that, that jumped out at me, do you know in the UK when the CEO will earn the total of the average worker in his company? What date in the calendar do you think he gets to um, when the average worker, well, at the end of the year, what date? Three or four days. Yeah, yeah. F what? First of January? They don't work on the 1st of January, <laughs> they, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't stop them, I suppose. Yeah, it's the 4th of January, so four day, well, they don't work the 1st, so at f it's 4th January, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, the janitor, who's not uh, below the average wage, he's probably like three years working by the time he's done three days. So it's just that, that's the society we work in. Um, who believes this question again? Who believes business is a force for good? I think it very much depends if you're one of the afortunados or the desafortunados, right? If you're on the other side, if you're on the other side, the reality, not the spin side, but the reality, that's the context in which this sustainability debate is happening. Um, business doesn't choose to be part of it. It is part of it. This isn't, that's why it can't just be an aside. It has to be fundamental to, to, to how you produce your goods, how you engage your consumers, because it's the world in which you live, and it's also the world in which you depend. You can't run a business without energy. You can't run a business without access to water if you're a manufacturer. You know, you can't run it if it's too hot and everyone's fainting at their desks. Uh, you, can't, you can't do business on a broken planet or something is one of those phrases that's, 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 that's divvied around. So sustainability, this is the context. That's why we're talking about it. That's why you're gathered. That's why there's interest in it. But what does it mean? It means everything to everyone and nothing to everyone. So we get Continent doing their nice little you know, things around Christmas. And we get employees going off and doing their tree planting things. We get the CEOs cutting ribbons on hospitals that they've supported. We get charity events. I'm not saying this is any bad. I'm just saying um, this is the scope of what's happening. We're getting media all the time. We're getting podcasts and TV programs and, and, and magazine articles. We're getting serious investment. This, is, this was the most powerful wind turbine um, in Europe when it was built uh, in 2019 in Viana de Costello. 60,000 people, 60,000 houses can run off that offshore uh, innovative uh, 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 infrastructure project. That's real money. Cars, again, real money. Uh, Tesla, they sold 480,000 cars just in the last quarter, but they weren't even the biggest EV seller. BYD, who's heard of BYD? Yeah, Warren Buffett had heard of BYD, I'll tell you, 15 years ago when he stuck some money in it. It's now worth something like 770 billion, its, val it, 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 its valuation. Uh, they sold 550,000 cars just in the last... There's no Mercedes, the Ford, all these companies um, <coughs> that were running... You know, the market has completely changed, is what I'm saying. Um, so regulation... Policymakers love this stuff. Environment, labor rights, whatever. This is the, the, the corporate sustainability reporting directive. You know, 50,000 European companies are going to have to, to uh, uh, fill in non financial reports, get them audited, blah, blah, blah. There's loads of work, it's loads of uh, liabilities if, if you don't meet with those regulations. They're putting out reports. 
I've got, oh, endless certification programs and associations and labels and um, uh, oh, business associations, BS, BS, BCSD. There's a gazillion of these as well. Um, business for social responsibility in America. Um, have lots of conferences. We like our panel discussions. We like our uh, campaigns. And of course, they, all the consultants are all over this, uh, coming up with their management tables and selling you protocols. And it's confusing landscape. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's bad or it's good. It's just, it's a lot of things going on in this space. What happens when lots of things go in this space? We get the Medusa problem. We get the snakes um, with different faces. Um, some are dangerous, <laughs> some aren't to be trusted, some are to be trusted. It, it's a confusing, it's a confusing landscape. What happens when, when people are confused? There's a, there's a, there's, we quickly jump into delegitimizing it. We think the whole thing is rubbish because we see chinks and we're ready to already think a bit. We saw the trust figures. Even you guys, not everyone put their hands up when it comes to trusting business. We sense that they, you know, there's a hidden agenda here. Um, the problem is that those big problems, climate change, uh, economic inequality, nature crisis, they're not going away. We need business at the table. But there's a danger because of the confusion out there that it will be delegitimized. Efforts by business to engage in this space to pursue sustainability agendas will get lost in greenwashing. Now, I'm not saying uh, companies are saints. They're not. And some greenwashing is completely valid. So Coca-Cola saying that their Coca-Cola life is sweetness from natural sources, lower calorie, 6.6% .6 sugar. You know, this is it's not 12% sugar as it was, so they can say, oh, we've made a great effort. Still 6.6% .6 sugar, okay? So you know that fact, you think these guys are, you know, BS, Ryanair, anything Ryanair says. They've got a brilliant um, a Twitter account, by the way, if anyone wants to follow it. It's like some junior, so they've got some 17-year-old doing it. He's really cheeky and sarcastic. Um, uh, they were, they, no, I won't tell you. You do go and have a look. It's quite funny. But they were trying to sell their services as, as being the lowest emissions. A lot of these claims are often relative. We're the lowest, but you know the bar is so low that it, it, it's, it's, not a great, it's not a great claim. They were told they had to remove that. Likewise, HSBC Bank boasting about their uh, climate change doesn't do borders. Yes, but we still invest in, in fossil fuels and, and, and coal mines. Again, told to remove it. So who trusts our leaders to tell us the truth? Uh, business, 39%, government, 38%, media, 36%. That came out this week. So we, only 39% of people out there trust business leaders. Yes, it's better than government. Yes, it's better than media. But it's still not very high, is it? And we're trying to engage the public on this really important topic. So is there a conspiracy going on? Are businesses trying to kind of uh, to, 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 to confuse us, to persuade us that they're, they're saints when they're not? Um, I choose not to believe in that, not because there aren't examples of bad businesses out there, but mostly because 25 years working in business, talking to business people, most people are all right. You know, there's some assholes, but most of them are all right. And most of them are doing, you know, they've got multiple motivations. They want to earn a good salary, but they also want to look their grandkids in the eye and said, you know, I did a good job, right? That's just my instinct, that institutions, companies, yes, they need to answer their shareholders. Yes, they're bound within this capitalist system. But the people that make them up are you know, just like society, some good guys, some bad guys. So I don't believe in this kind of, and I can't afford to believe in it because of those issues that I discussed, the context. You know? Business has the resources. It has the innovation. It ha can have the answers. And we need to hold on to that. I can't afford to be skeptical. As a journalist, skepticism is, is, and cynicism is like you wear it as a trophy. It's, um, it, it shows that you're professional. You don't believe anyone. But I think in this space, we can't afford to do that. But I do think there's a lack of clarity. That's, that's, the, that's the problem that sustainability is facing. And, and that's why we're seeing this backlash. Uh, and it's not just people on the, not just consumers on the street saying this whole thing is, is made up and doesn't make sense. We're also seeing investors um, acting against those that are investing in woke capitalism, as they define it, which is taking your social and environmental responsibility seriously. It's a big issue, especially in the US. Let me tell you a bit about my story. How did I get here? How, how do I happen to be standing here in front of you today, whittling on? Um, I went to the Dominican Republic when I was a student. It was paid for by Shell. 
I, I knew that at the time, but I, what I didn't expect was then for them to invite me once I'd been, I was doing a, a building project, um, and then the next summer they said, come and work in, uh, in our offices in London, do an internship program. This was at a time when uh, the um, anti-capitalist riots, the first lot, the before the, the, the Occupy Wall Street, the anti-capitalist riots were happening, and... Uh, they were in trouble half a lot. They're still in trouble, but they're in trouble at the time because they were in bed with the Nigerian junta and they put to death this guy, this poet called Ken Sarawiwa, uh, and people were boycotting there. And they also tried to dump this platform in the North Sea. And so they were the hate figure. But at the same time, um, the internet was coming in, uh, environmental movements were taking off, and suddenly these, these big institutions, so Shell's argument at the time was, well, we've, we've had our lawyers all over this. We're allowed to dump this thing in the sea. Uh, uh, environmentally, arguably, it's safer and cleaner to do it there than to do it on land. Uh, their engineers had you know, put forward all, they ticked all the boxes. Well, they hadn't realized society had changed. The expectations on business had changed. And I was really excited by the opportunities that opened up that you could hold business to account. And as a journalist, um, well, I first tried out as a consultant, so I spent five years working for a boutique consultancy in London, advising large companies, Unilever in particular, on social impact issues, social measurement, all that stuff. And I took some time out to do uh, a PhD at Cambridge in anthropology, looking at the role that, that companies play and how they legitimize their investments overseas in mining and other uh, impactful, impactful um, uh, uh, investment areas. But most of my time I spent as a journalist, just me, much younger, living in South America, traveling around, writing a book project. Um, so I've worked for, for The Guardian, uh, always on a freelance basis because it allows me to, 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 to focus in on sustainability, a bit for the, for the Financial Times, for The Times, for Reuters. This went out today. Um, Davos, brands and faith groups hold hands in an unlikely alliance. That didn't, that didn't capture the headlines of the Davos coverage, I'm conscious, but you know, um, anyway. Uh, Let's come back to our objective. So I'm setting context, saying a bit about me, where I'm at. Decode sustainable, sustainability's five faces. What are they? What are these five faces? Before I jump in, I'm going to take you through five articles that I've done. And I sort of have, have gone through my, my back catalogue. I found the first article I ever wrote for, uh, wrote for The Guardian. It was in 2004. It's about a guy called Derek Higgs, who was one of these sort of city grandees. Uh, and it came after there was a scandal involving a company called WorldCom and Enron, which was back in the early 2000s. And there was sort of panic that the governance of large companies was corrupt and needed to be modernized. So they brought this chap in, Derek Higgs. And he sort of <coughs> came up with a template of, 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 of better governance, like maybe chairman don't employ your mates to be your non-execs. Non-execs maybe get some professionalism. Mm, maybe let's have an audit committee that really looks at the numbers a bit more. That sort of thing. So standard governance. Um, I did this story about four or five years ago when I first came here. Um, lithium. It's suddenly become the story, right? But when I was doing it, uh, it's a British company, one of them, Sa um, Savannah Resources, that are up in, in the Barroso mine near uh, Botigas in the north. I went and visited them. They were all about, okay, so we've got this license, or at the time they didn't have it, we want to have this license um, uh, to exploit the lithium in the ground and all the other metals that happen to be there as well. That, that's, that's a separate story. Um, but at the same time, we realized that we want, you know, in order to do that, we need to invest back into the community. We need to give jobs. We need to uh, train up local suppliers so they can be part of our supply chain. So this community that, you know, is pretty under everyone that knows the interior of, uh, of, of, of Portugal, it, it's, um, you know, it's pretty desperate out there, right? There's just old people living in small villages. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Probably you guys have got nice house, houses there as well. But, um, you know, this area is, 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 uh, is very marginalized economically. So coming in to, um, to bring economic impetus, that was very much their thing. We want to, you know, be a positive influence in this area and, and, and be good citizens. Um, this is an article I did for a, a fantastic magazine called Positive News. Um, it's, it's, it tries to, it's the antithesis to the doom scrolling. They try and find stories that are you know, rooted in truth, but like, really inspiring as well. Does anyone know who this chap is? I was hoping someone to tell me because it, it went out of my head for a while. Uh, Patrick Brown. Patrick Brown, he was a medical professor at Stanford, like super brainy guy, uh, leading departments in genetics and stuff like that. And when he got to about 50, he just thought, this, this, 
the world's going to pop. I need to take some time out. I'm worried about climate change. I need to come up with a solution. What can I do? And his solution was uh, these alternative meats. He runs a company called Impossible, Impossible Foods. So they make those burgers. They're famous. They went on a TV competition. They had a, a, a chicken nugget uh, and they, a live kind of TV test uh, between a chicken nugget and their chicken nugget that wasn't really chicken. It was made from soya. Um, and uh, I can't remember what it was. I'd lie, but you know, I'm a journalist, I can do that. Eight out of 10 said that the chicken was more chickeny than the actual chicken. Uh, and so he got like 50 people, 50 of these me me uh, uh, medical kind of his colleagues to work out what is it that makes meat meaty? What is it, what's the protein or what is the chemical kind of structure? What is it that gives it that taste, that tanginess, that stringiness, the structure? And this thing called heme, apparently. And I did look it up, it's in my notes what it means. But they focused in on this, they realized they can get it from soya. And now his company's worth, I think, six billion, something like that. Um, so that here, Impossible Foods. This is a story I did a, a, a little while ago about, um, a bit like the Oxfam report, a report on inequality, but it was showing, it's from an outfit called the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, BCSD, their partners. Uh, and it was, it was saying what business can, how business contributes to inequality, but what can it do? Like, you know, provide safe, dignified work, pay a decent wage, um, respect unions, you know the drill, pay your taxes, those sort of stuff. Um, and this story, who knows this guy? This guy I do know, I can remember his name. Yeah, yeah. Yvonne Chonard, I think it is. He's, he's American. He lives in California. So he used to be a, a rock climber back in the 70s. He actually started out by selling those rugby, rugby shirts. Um, he, he sort of imported them to the States, sold them to his mates, and then he sold the crampons for climbing to his friends. Anyway, he built this massive business and um, two years ago decided he's 85 now. Um, he's got two kids. Um, his company's turning over uh, revenues of now over a billion dollars a year. They sell, you know, Patagonia, they sell the, uh, the jackets and the outdoor gear. Um, he, he handed it into a foundation. It's a private company, two kids, both in their 50s. Didn't want to labor them with, you know, ownership of this company. So he, he left them 2%. 98% of his company now sits in a charitable foundation with the exclusive goal of saving our one home planet, which is their term. So all the, when you go and buy one of those jackets, the, any profits go into environmental campaigns, basically, uh, either large scale or small scale. What is the connecting idea? What connects all those stories? It's not, it's not a difficult question. I sort of gave the answer away. What's the one theme that connects those? Sustainability. How does that help us? Not very much. We're back at the Medusa problem, right? What does that? There were five completely different stories, and yet the linking idea is sustainability. So the five faces. Before we jump into those, let's just there is there are definitions for what sustainability means, right? It doesn't come from the business world, it comes from this woman. It feels like I'm sort of, there must be some game show where you have to sort of name people. Who's this? Yeah, very good. Who got that? Don't be shy. Well done. Yeah. Gro Harlem Brundtland. She was 29th Prime Minister of Norway in the um, late 80s, early 90s. Then went on to run the WHO, I think. But in the interim, the UN gave her a job uh, to run a commission about uh, development. And she came up with this now famous... Um, definition. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's basically the nuts and bolts of it, right? That is sustainability. Business needs to interpret that in a way that makes sense and is true to that definition. Everyone, you, you, you might not have seen it before, but you, you, it resonates, right? It makes sense. Yeah? Yeah? We've heard it in lots of different ways, interpreted in different ways, in, not in that language. But that idea that you know, we can't over, overuse what we have now, we need to leave it for future generations. That's the essence of sustainability, durability, long-term, protecting the future, stewardship, these kind of ideas. Um, it was made famous because in the, there was a 1992 Earth Summit where that idea was really, and we celebrated the 30th anniversary of that. Um, it's also given birth to initiatives like the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, and then their replacement, the Sustainable Development Goals. We're all familiar with those. 
weren't taught them in school either, but you know, uh, this, is the, this is a way of trying to crystallize that endeavor and make the world a, a more sustainable place, right? So no poverty, zero hunger. Uh, again, desperate states. Only 15% were on track, and we're supposed to be delivering these in 2030. Gutierrez, the, you know, has, is uh, your, your, your countryman, is on record as... I've got notes, but you know he's very upset about this. He's always when he's when we have SDG summits, you know, he's saying we've got to pull our fingers out. And we're going to miss these. And business has interpreted those um, again in 2015 in this initiative called the UN Global Contact Compact, which now represents, I think, 45,000 companies around the world, and it's an attempt to kind of um, interpret those SDGs in a context which makes sense for business. Ushinko. Who knows this? Do you know? I grew up on this. Yeah, now we're seeing our age. Yeah, Enid Blyton. She's totally non-PC now. You can't read Enid Blyton. <laughs> she's, her language is terrible, apparently, and there's stereotypes and all that. But Ushinko, the famous five, we call them in English. Um, the five faces. This is where you have to You know, this is where we're actually going to do some work. And uh, uh, if you've got notebooks, I'm not going to test you afterwards, but the five, at least five faces, the Medusa problem of sustainability, first, business ethics. Quite familiar with this concept, it, it uh, stresses, you know, honesty, morality, uh, based rooted in 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 cultural and often uh, uh, religious traditions. Um, ethics applies to all different organisations. Business ethics has its very, uh, you know, you can do you can you can do masters programmes in business ethics alone. It's a long trajectory. It's the kind of uh, opposite of it's not the opposite, but it sits alongside uh, your legal obligations. Your your uh, there's a lovely quote from um, uh, Martin Luther King. Where he talks about the role of the law. He says the law can stop lynching. It can stop you lynching me, but it can't make you love me. So the ethics bit is that kind of additional kind of moral fairness, that idea. He also says it's quite good to have a law that means you can't lynch me. By the way, so I'm not saying law is a bad thing, but ethics. Like so, corporate citizenship, slightly more uh, nuanced phrase, perhaps not as common. Um, anyone kind of got some thoughts on what corporate citizenship might mean? Has anyone heard the phrase? Does it translate into Portuguese? Cida de Nia. We, we teach that in schools, at least now, don't we? So there's quite a... there's this um, The company that I worked for, I referred that I worked for five years in London, boutique, it was called the Corporate Citizenship Company. And um, the ideas are based in, in go back to the, the 17th century British philosopher and political theorist John Locke, the idea of, of, of natural rights, inalienable rights to uh, life and liberty. Um, this is the notion that uh, we have individual rights, but we have collective communal responsibilities as part of the societies in which we, we live. So, um, uh, yes, as a modern company, under the Joint sh uh, uh, Shareholders Act, you can, uh, Stockholders Act, you can, uh, as a company, have certain rights that humans will have to own property, to sue, to da da da. But with those, uh, to e exploit natural resources. But with those come certain responsibilities, right? That's the basic idea. Corporate citizenship, business ethics, corporate citizenship, corporate social responsibility. Oh, we're familiar with corporate social responsibility, right? RSA, CSR, it's everywhere. Uh, it goes back to, well, it's got a long history, but it was sort of systematized by a chap called Andy Carroll, uh, Andy Carroll, Carroll, anyway, 1979. Um, the, it's the, 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 the sort of, it uses this pyramid idea. Um, Philanthropic responsibilities would also be within business ethics, but it's at the top, right? At the bottom is economic uh, sustainability, economic responsibility, economic viability. The idea that we are not a charity, we are a business. In order to contribute to society, I need to make returns. I need to pay my taxes. I need to be able to pay the suppliers that provide me with it. I need to provide you with a good job and make sure at the end of the month the checkbook, you know, the, the salary comes through. That is a function, that is a responsibility of business to, to be economic actors. And on top of that, to make sure you don't overstep the law. But coming back to um, the Martin Luther King quote, it's just to meet the legal minimum. It doesn't push you to go over the top of that. Um, it's sort of born out of, um, uh, uh, um, I suppose it's more sort of business friendly, uh, sort of 
the capitalist with a small c kind of kind of philosophy. But every picture of CSR <laughs> has, for some reason, I don't understand, plants and hands. <laughs> so business ethics, corporate citizenship, CSR, plants and hands, shared value. Now this will be on your course if you were to do the uh, the, the the master's program. Shared value very sort of hot now. Um, why? Because it speaks the language of business. Nestle love it. They're all over it. Why? Because it makes their shareholders happy. They understand the language of value. It comes to this. Uh, it was made sort of popular. In t it was back in 2006, actually, this uh, Harvard Business Review piece by the economist Michael Porter and jurist Mark Kramer. Um, read that. It will tell you everything you need to know. But essentially, uh, Milton Friedman, we all know him, business, business, business. Uh, this is... This is this is the kind of, I, I see it as is, um, like the MBA version of sustainability. Like it speaks all those languages. You understand what economic value is, but, and it sort of talks about social and environmental value in those same terms. Um, this is the classic win-win. This is the idea that there's synergy between you know, your business strategy to grow here, but also to have positive impact there, shared value. And the last one, regenerative business, my term. Actually, not my term, because that came from a book called Regenerative <laughs> Business. But I sort of was, when I was thinking of the five, this was the term, and then I went and found the book. Uh, this is based in the notion, who knows Overshoot Day? You heard this? It's something WWF do. So uh, <clears throat> when we were talking before that we have the, that idea of, uh, of a sustainable development that we need to leave, you know, to, to not use our resources to stay in a way that will, um, will affect the, the ability of others to use them in the future. Basically, WWF, the Environment Organization, work out how many renewable resources, uh, non-renewable resources are on the planet that we can use, right, in a, in a way that's sustainable. Back in, the, and they took 1970 as when we were in par. We were using what we could use, right? And then every year since then, uh, we've overused. And I think the date now is August the 1st. So every time you buy, you know, every time you fill up your car after August 1st, every time you buy that packaging and chuck it in the bin, every time you do whatever, breathe more or less, uh, after the system that we have created means that we are eating in to our renewable budget. So regenerative business tries to do the opposite. It tries to produce a system of, of net positive. Um, so you actually somehow, Coca-Cola have this as an ambition, produce more water than what you had at the beginning quite know how they do it, but they've got some logic around it. But carbon, you hear a lot about that, will store more carbon than we emit. The idea is that you're in balance, right? And ideally, you're even better than in balance. You're, you're doing extra. You're leaving the world better than when you found it. That's the idea of regenerative business. Who can remember all five? Got a better memory than me if you can. Anyway, uh, I can. Business ethics, corporate citizenship, CSR, Shared value, regenerative business. So I said uh, we are our goals. What were they? What were they? Just gone through them. How do they differ? So again, I'm going to ask you to do a bit of work. Can you join the dots? So we've got the theories on the left, the different faces, and we've got the stories that I taught you through on the right. Let's start at the top, business ethics. Any pun. So you remember, let me talk them through. Derek Higgs, the, 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 the bastion of the, of the city, sorting out um, corrupt governance or weak governance in corporates. We've got Mr. Chouinard from Patagonia that gave his company away uh, for, to save our home one planet. We've got Mr. Brown, the scientist turned alternative meat entrepreneur. Uh, we've got Portugal's lithium dreams and Savannah resources trying to be... Um, uh, to, to, to uh, I don't want to give it away, um, to, uh, you know, uh, to, to be a respected, um, to earn its place in that community. And at the top there, we've got that report on inequality and what business can do to reduce inequality. Who wants to say, which one of those business ethics would you say? Higgs, Higgs, well done, good. Corporate citizenship. Rights and responsibilities, do you remember? 
social contract, inalienable rights. Who's our corporate citizen? They mix and merge, right? So they, you know, you arguably they they all borrow from each other. They sit under the same sustainability umbrella, but some had stronger emphases than others. Let's leave that CSR. Which one do you think fits that? Do you remember the triangle, the Carroll Triangle from 1979? Economics, legal, leading to philanthropy. Patagonia. We're going to get we're going to get ourselves in a twist, you see, as we work our way down. Share value. Who's making a packet out of this? Who is fine? Who has found the win-win? Who is saving the planet and earning themselves a fortune? The chicken guy. The chicken guy. Someone say the chicken guy. Impossible Foods. Patrick Brown, Professor Patrick Brown of Stanford University. Regenerative business. Who has? Tick the box for net positive. Who is within their earth shoot? It's Patagonia. Patagonia, have you noticed? They've aren't, you've answered each one. <laughs> I'm going to suggest these. And I'd say, they're, you know, it's, it's a bit of a game. But yeah, business ethics, Derek Higgs. Um, it's all about uh, moral conduct. It's about good practice. It's about honesty in the, in, in, in the boardrooms that run our, our large companies. Corporate citizenship, I've suggested it's, it's Savannah Resources, the idea that they want to belong, they want to give back, they're investing in schools, they're investing in supplies, they're desperate to show the government that they are a force for good, that, the, that, that um, what's, what state is that, what province is it in Botica? Trashmont. will be better off thanks to Savannah Resources because, yes, they're going to dig up that hillside, but they're going to leave people with better jobs, better prospects, blah, blah, blah. So they're a welcome part of the community. It's all about their social license to operate. You know that term? Corporate social responsibility. I suggested it's um, uh, uh, attacking inequality. Um, uh, because, um, because that economic base, right? You can't do business in, in you, you need to, you, you, you need to, um, to, to generate wealth and share that wealth in a way that reduces inequality, that means that you have employees on side, that your suppliers get paid. This idea that uh, a broke, an economic inequality doesn't serve your purposes as a responsible actor, but it's that kind of economic focus, um, coupled with your legal responsibilities to make sure that you know, there aren't child labor and uh, abusive practices, that you pay your taxes, all those sorts of things. So all the kind of arguments that they were putting forward in that report sing CSR. They, you, can see, you can almost map them onto that triangle. And then Mr. Patrick Brown uh, uh, shared value. So it just is worth six billion. You know, that answers it. But at the same time, he's reduced, he would claim he's reduced deforestation by, by getting us off meat, reducing those, um, the demand for, um, for, for, for cattle ranching in, in particularly in, in South America, in the Amazon basin. Um, he is using soya, which also you know, has its related problems, but in less, less volume. Uh, he would argue it's healthier for you as well. So he's got sorts of positive spins, but he's also found this niche market that's growing. It's appealing to Gen Zs. You know, he can charge a premium for it. So it's a, it's a neat, neat value-laden uh, proposition. Uh, so Mr. Tunard, regenerative business. He, um, his business, because it's his, now exists to solve the environmental crisis in which we live. That's what he would claim. At the same time, he's making clothes, right? He's using materials, and they have impacts. And so some of it is one step forward, one step back. But he would hope that he's going one and a half step forwards and one step back through these other through the investments of his... Um, through the investments of, of, of the company back into those environmental programs. So the two questions... Uh, uh, that we, we started, what are they, uh, how do they differ, why do they differ is a question that I'm not going to answer, but I'm just going to put it out there. Why are there different forms of, um, of sustainability? Uh, culture is a big part. Uh, I sort of explored this for a while when I was working more regularly for The Guardian, um, talking, uh, this, talking to indigenous groups, 
buen vivir, this idea as from South America, idea of non-ownership that the indigenous have, so that they're stewards of nature, that also things are in balance. Ecuador has actually put buen vivir into its constitution, this idea that you need, that, that um, the environment can't speak for itself, but it has a legitimate place at the table, and therefore governments and others need to speak on its behalf. Um, uh, you read the article about Gandhi. This one is, uh, you know, for them, uh, business, this was a, this in Indonesia, a social enterprise that was selling uh, indigenous products, uh, agricultural products produced uh, that, uh, um, in, a, in a way that fitted with the indigenous culture. So one of the big things was rice. Like, I didn't know this. I thought rice, was, there were three types of rice, right? White, yellow, sometimes, and brown. She was like, there's, there's hundreds. When I was a kid, we used to eat dozens of different. There's red rice. She said there's blue rice. And so her business was all about, uh, about uh, recognizing in indigenous, indigenous heritage by using heritage seeds, literally, these seeds that they were saving from species that weren't, didn't, didn't fit with the mass production model um, to produce in small quantities but at high, uh, 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 with high margins because they were... You know, packaged up with this notion of this cultural baggage that came with it. So I'm just sort of flagging that culture is an important part. What other parts would 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 cause companies to have different approaches to sustainability? Culture is a big part, I would argue. Size is a big part, right? If you're running Unilever, your issues are going to be different from if you're running a mum and pop short store on the corner. Ownership is a massive deal. The reason Chunar could do that with Patagonia is he owned the thing. He can do whatever he liked. Um, in, it was a good, when Trump, let's, well, no, no, I'm not going to go there, but like, the last Trump, uh, he cut taxes. They saved 10 million. Not a lot, but you know, enough. That was 10 million that was going to go to, to um, 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 into, the, uh, into, into the state into state revenues. And he thought that was a good thing. You know, he thought that would go to schools, that might go to roads. So instead of just pocketing it himself like all the other corporations did, because he owned the business, he had 10 million there, he said, he wrote a press release and said, I'm going to give this to charity, I'm going to give this to environmental campaign groups that are going to campaign against you, Mr. Trump. He also had this fantastic campaign against uh, wild salmon and, uh, uh, and against dams. So all the rivers, loads of rivers, hydro's good, yeah, renewable, great, but it's not great for rivers and it's not great if you're a fish. And um, so he's, he ran this whole campaign. They've got, they've got like a TV arm. They make films, campaign films. This is a business, but they've got this campaign. It's got nothing to do with Patagonia. It's just like they go after certain issues. And one of them was dams and de-damming. And, um, and uh, he got a knock on the door one day from his marketing manager that sells the fisherman gear. Like Patagonia have a big market in, 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 in waders and rods and the jackets when you go out fishing, the wild fishing goes, I think this might reflect badly uh, on our consumer group. You know, we're basically telling them that, you know, because they love the dams, because above the dam, you get an artifact, you get one of those lakes that they can all fish in. And he's saying, we, we don't think this is good. Because uh, it's not natural, you know, they're, 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 they're spawned and stuff like that. I just said, I don't give a shit. I don't care. Because <laughs> he runs a business, right? You can't do that if you run Unilever or if you run Nestle. So ownership is a massive deal. Um, what face of sustainability is most common in Portuguese firms, would you say? Why? The five options there. What do you think predominates? CSR? Uh, so, so, business ethics, CSR, shared value? Sound a bit sort of... Well, is that because it's it's a term that you're not familiar with? It's modern, or is it just sits badly with with a Portuguese company? Yeah, it's quite sophisticated. It, it involves quite a, a high degree of understanding and, and management and sort of strategic vision and all the rest of it. Um, I'd say philanthropy is quite strong here still. The kind of traditional CSR. So you know, you concentrate on the tip. You can't. You know that's the that's the bit where the you know the CEO cutting the ribbon and sp sponsoring the local scouts and doing the employee volunteering day. None of that's bad, but it sits. Do you see how small the importance was in the triangle? All the focus is there, but actually, what we're about is economic responsibility, paying our taxes, generating revenue to you know to to contribute to national growth and to helping people pay their mortgages. That's a responsible business, and there's, I'm not saying that there's no good or bad here, right? 
Um, but it's interesting just to hear what you, your reflections are on the situation in Portugal. So, well done. Um, we're coming towards the end. Don't worry. So we've done, we've, we've hopefully ticked number one. What are they? What are the five faces? We talked a bit about how they differ. Why do they matter? Um, I think this is, this, is, this is the crux for me, anyway, as someone that's worked in the communications space. Um, they matter for, at least, they matter for lots of reasons, but, but I'm just going to play out why they matter with a couple of case studies. Two related to strategy. So the first example uh, from Patagonia. So um, how would you manage a business if your goal was not to generate revenues for yourself or for your shareholders, but to generate revenues in order to save our one home planet, the one that we can't replace if we screw it up? How would your strategy be different than if you adopted a CSR position, for example? What things might you do, what things might you not do? Yeah. Impact like just flesh that out for me. What kind of impacts might you like to reevaluate? Yeah. 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 So there's a, there's a temporal element to it. When are you are you quarterly or are you talking about ten years time? But it's also what you're measuring, right? I mean, companies measure very well when it comes to sales revenues and market share and return on investment, right? They're very good at that. Not so good on, um, you know, uh, economic regeneration or um, human rights impacts. Why? Because it's, it's, it's difficult. And there's so many environmental consultancies out there. If anyone wants jobs, environmental consultancies, they'll take you. And there's huge demand because well, you can tick this stuff off. You can go and measure the, 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 the nitrous oxide coming out of the chimney. You know, it's easy to do. It's much harder to evaluate your impact on society. You know, how, where do you even start? But that's the challenge. That's exactly what you've got to do. Um, totally. You've got to side, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and your consequent decisions might be, maybe we shouldn't be selling, you know, uh, Coca-Cola Life and calling it natural when it's 6.6% .6 sugar and it's adding to the obesity problem and destroying kids' teeth. And maybe we might have to de-invest from certain things. We might have to invest in others, right? Um, this is this is an example of uh, uh, this is from Albania where they supported um, a campaign to uh, to turn uh, uh, the one river in Albania that hasn't got a dam on it. They persuaded the government. They supported local charities, campaigners to turn it into a national park. So now it can't be touched. Problem is the same river goes into Greece and it's got a dam there. But um, they invest massively in regenerative. Um, Organic agriculture, for example. All the cotton that goes into those T-shirts. You know, look at the plains of Uzbekistan, a complete disasters, desertified, no water. Why? Because cotton is really thirsty. It's grown on uh, in it, it with loads of chemicals, huge runoff. The lakes are a disaster. But they're, they're complicit in that. So they recognize that. They recognize that we're going to sell, we're going to continue to sell shirts with cotton in. Um, we need to come up with a better solution. So investing with partners. Um, through your supply chain, finding other actors that might kind of get on board to, to shift the status quo. The easiest thing is to carry on doing what everyone else is doing, right? And you keep, you, the, also, the, not only the easiest, but it's the best excuse. Well, they're doing it as well. Just to step out is a massive challenge. And it will be if you're genuinely coming out of this business school as leaders, those are the kind of decisions that you have to make. Um, how do you, what happens to the end of use? Um, only 17% of their stuff ever get... Uh, no, I'm making that up. Ah, um, <laughs> reuse is massive for them because they work in a fashion, the fashion industry, essentially a clothing industry, that the whole business model is causing you every new season you go and buy, chuck away the old, you buy... So they're there trying to get around to the idea that actually, um, you know, our clothes are good. They're not super fashionable, but it means they don't go out of fashion. They're usable. So you might get a rip in it. Well, instead of chucking it in the bin and buying another one, 
come, we'll repair, we'll repair it. Moreover, we'll set up a center in Amsterdam where our European base are, and we'll get refugees who need a job, who need to learn the language, who need to get integrated, whose kids need to get into school. We'll teach them to be tailors. They will fix your clothes that we will give back to you. We will pay 25 euros for every item that comes back, covering the cost of sending and returning, uh, giving them viable jobs, but also creating multiple touch points with our consumers. We get, you know, instead of just walking to our shop, buying, walking out, in order to go through this process of, 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 um, of reuse and repair, you get like six, seven, you get to email them afterwards, you get to email them before, you get to talk, you may get contact when they hand it over, all those sorts of. <coughs> Nestle, shared value, remember? All about win-win, finding, investing, strategic investments, blah, blah. If you look in their, their, their annual report, the one that they have to, they don't have to. Well, they do have to under these new... Do they? No, they're in Switzerland, so they can just avoid all that. Uh, but were they to be in the, in the European Union, they had to produce this annual non-financial report, sustainability report. If you were to go in there, it's called shared value. That's the, that's the headline. It's got this uh, materiality index. This stuff, the top left, that's what they care about. Why? Because that's where their impact is biggest both their negative impact and their positive, their potential for positive impact. So that's where the risks lie, but also where the benefits lie. But on the bottom here um, is, the, is the impact on business success. They are not interested in this. It's negligible. Business success, negligible. Fortunately, there's no big impacts in there, but like business ethics, community relations, moderate, moderate business impact, and moderate impact on people and environment arguably, they would say, because our community relations are great. But they're interested in that bit up there, because that's where positive impact is and where business... So, makes sense. You map, you do... It's quite basic for when you come up with your sustainability strategy, do a kind of risk matrix uh, or materiality, what's relevant to us. And if you come with a shared value kind of mindset, you go for the top right. So the top right, what's it say? Health and nutrition, flog all those kind of good for you, um, yeah, the the you know alternative meat, the the low calorie, the blah blah blah. Um, what else is up there? Environment and social impacts of ingredients, supply chain, product quality and safety. Yeah, that's where they concentrate their funding. So there's there's a the strategy element. Depending on which of those five faces you choose for, you will approach this with a different philosophy, with different goals, with different mentality, investing your resources in a different way putting your leaders onto different you know, kind of projects. Does that make sense? That's, that's logical, right? Communication strategy. Um, and let's leave it here. What happens um, if we get it wrong? Um, what happens if we present in a way that doesn't coordinate with what we're doing or what we want to communicate? So if I'm saying I'm doing sustainability, you think at CSR, you think it's business ethics. You think, because you're an investor, it's, sh it's, sh it's shared value. Uh, and um, you, know, you think it's corporate position because you live next to the Barossa mine and you want a job or you want them you know, not to destroy your garden. Um, when I say, uh, bah, 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 um, I paid my taxes this year and they are 50% higher than last year because you know, I've built a, a brilliant business on the back of this nutritional product or this li lithium price going through the roof, um, what will you hear? Just play it out. Just think, think, think. The first question is, do my actions match up with, with my communications? So that's the substance piece. But there's also your expectation. Like, how do you understand sustainability? If I'm talking in one way and you're hearing something else or you're wanting to hear something else, there's a mismatch, right? And that's why we get this distrust level that's massive and can delegitimize this whole area. If you go on to do the master's program, you'll get friends certainly going, yeah, come on, we, know, we all know it's spin, or we all know it's chat, or we all know it's not very effective, or we know it, you do it on the side. It's because there's this dissonance between uh, our message and our actions, but our message and your understanding. So there's an obligation on me if I'm communicating to communicate with you in a way you understand. And if you have a picture in your head of what sustainability is and it doesn't fit mine, I need to explain what mine is better. So you can either reject it or you know, assess it on its merits. 
or I can convince you to think freshly about sustainability. But it's a communicate. There's a massive communications challenge there. So my PhD was um, focused on a on a company. Uh, it was it's a Swedish company called Store Enzo that do pulp. I think they might have investments here as well. But you probably locked it up, haven't you? Your own papaletas have locked up the local market. But they're they're massive, really old company, and they invested in Uruguay. Biggest ever foreign investment in Uruguay's history. This is on the back of a massive fight with Argentina and Uruguay over a pulp mill just up the road. It went to Uruguay, so the Argentines blocked a, uh, an international bridge. Uh, you know, Argentines are nuts anyway. I lived there for long enough, I can say that. I've got Argentine children, kind of technically. They've got passports. Um, but, you know, uh, it was a big incident. Then they come in, they're desperate, like... Savannah Resources up in, up in Botigas to be seen as a good citizen. So how do they communicate? Jobs. That way, the politicians can go, Store Enzo, Montes del Plata, they're called. Aren't they, aren't they you know, they've employed 4,000, at one stage they had 6,000 people. This is a small country, 3 million, 6,000 workers working on this one project for two years. I can say, you know, added something like 3% to GDP. It was crazy. And that helps... The, the, the government, the politicians that are signing us off say, no, these guys are good news. Talk about communi community projects. They were very strong on kind of training, not giving away, you know, it was a sort of um, development orthodoxy now, not to, 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 you know, to teach to fish rather than to give the fish. Their only problem, so they were going to build up entrepreneurs. The only problem was the village where they were linked to. They were all old grannies. They were all in their 70s. They were saying, you can take on the market. You can do this. <laughs> and they were like, oh, I'm going to run a little tea shop. And um, anyway, it was all quite sweet. But the language was like investing in the local area, being a good citizen. And they were very clear, we are not the government. That is another part of this kind of rights and responsibilities. You know, our responsibilities have a limit. Your responsibility, government, is to fund the school. Don't go asking us to do it. So that, that form of communication, you can imagine that they came along and said, uh, we're wonderful, we'll sign this check, we'll sign this. But th then people would just come constantly with their argument. They'll constantly come with a check. You know? So they were clean to communicate clearly because they had a corporate citizenship mindset. And it's finished with Patagonia, so regenerative mindset. Does, it, does, does anyone have heard this case study? You're nodding back there. 2015, was it? it was a Black Friday, biggest sales day in, what? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, canny, wasn't it? But those who don't know the story, they took out a full page ad in the New York Times, busiest sales day of the year, saying, don't buy this jacket. You don't need to. Just come and get it fixed, we'll fix it. And exactly as you say, everyone thought, this brand, they're amazing. <laughs> I'll go and buy their jacket. <laughs> so their sales went up, and they keep that a bit quiet. They're a bit embarrassed about that. But, you know, um, because they're trying to sell the message of consumption, consumption. We live in a consumption-driven economy, right? People stop buying. The whole thing slows down. We're in trouble. And they're ready to, to take that on and say, if we do keep on buying, we're going to continue to overshoot. And, we, you know, at the end, we'll run out of road. Um, this was the, um, they're, they're running a campaign at the moment in, in Iceland. I went to Iceland to see this a couple of years ago uh, against net, net salmon farming, wild salmon farming. It's, it's industrial netted salmon in a fjord, so it's in the sea. Um, there's loads of chemicals, they've got horrible diseases, and they sell this at premium prices and put Icelandic salmon. It's not even Icelandic salmon. It's Norwegian salmon. So they bring it in. They've, they've adapted them so their bodies, like those chickens, you know, with the massive bodies and tiny legs. These fish have their fins are tiny, but their bodies are huge. Uh, and the um, problem is that nets aren't secure. So sometimes they escape. This is one of the problems. The other problem is that underneath these nets, because all the chemicals they produce in one net, there's, there's um, 100,000 fish in one net. There's typically 12 nets per lagoon. Uh, they produce enough waste, fecal waste, of a city of 40,000 people. And there's no treatment. It's just like emptying raw sewage into the Icelandic waters. Then they escape and start breeding with the, with the, with the, local, the local, the indigenous um, species. That's the word. It's only 40,000. These salmon, you know what salmon do, right? Everyone knows what salmon do. They swim out. You know, after they're about a year, swim out to, they go to the Arctic. They, they hang around there for four years to get fattened up. And then they swim all the way back to where they were born, spawn and die. You know, that, that's their life. And you come back, you've been out of the sea for four years, you come back and you find this mangy fish that's escaped from the net. You know, 
the, doing your business of procreating in your, in, your, in your species. Anyway, my point was, the way they communicate this is they don't ask you to put Patagonia on anything. It's the only press trip I've ever been on where they say, you don't need to mention us. Don't mention it. Talk about the issue. Don't talk about us. Because they believe in the issue more than they believe. And word gets out. People like me come on the stage and start talking about it. But it's not direct marketing. It's that you see the sensitivity there. Because they're about the issue rather than about themselves. Um, they don't even use the word sustainable. They don't like it. Why? Because they're not sustainable. No company is sustainable. As long as you're taking resources out, using them, and not returning them, you're not sustainable. If you're producing our material, it's very difficult to do that in a sustainable way at, the, at present, right? 70%? Oh, I've forgotten what the number is. I'll make it up again. But they, they, they use polyester as in a mix in 70% of their goods. That comes, that's basically oil, right? It's a fossil fuel. And so... They're very sensitive about talking about sustainability. They won't claim. He's written a book. He wrote, Yvonne uh, Chenard wrote a book called Let My People Go Surfing. Really good read. But he's also written a book, if you were to do this course, The Responsible Company, in which he says, we're not responsible. I mean, which company is brave enough to go out and communicate, we are not responsible? Just imagine if they did. Imagine that, the, the confusion that would be overcome. We could have an honest conversation. We wouldn't be presenting ourselves as greener than green. We could have an actual conversation about how difficult it is to manage a supply chain that is five steps removed, how difficult it is to ensure that my worker in Mexico in the factory is being paid a fair wage and not being molested by his boss. You know, um, these are complicated issues, and understanding them at a functional level, as you would through a course like this, will, will really help you tease those out. But let's not pretend they're easy. And as a communications strategy, it's difficult to have an honest conversation. But people are desperate for that. Because they, they, we know, we work in companies or we consume their products. We see what happens. We understand that they're not perfect. So let's not pretend. That's their theory, at least. That's the way they communicate it. So the Medusa problem. Uh, lots of confusion out there. Lots of excitement. Thanks for hearing me out. Um, whether things are clearer or not, that's not really my responsibility. That's if you do the course, things will be clearer. Mine was to tear it up, so it was com complicated. There's this tension here between reality, what's happening on the ground, the substance of what companies are doing, and the substance of how they communicate it, and expectations on them, which are growing all the time. And those are out of sync. When they're out of sync, there's a, lot la uh, a, a, a loss of trust, and it's the responsibility of business to communicate more clearly. They can communicate more clearly um, if the semantics are clear. So. Five phases of sustainability. There's actually probably five more, and five more above that. But these five kind of illustrate the point. They are the main theories. Um, if we can communicate these clearly, if we can, that will help us manage them better and communicate them more clearly. So it's more than just semantics. It's substance. I hope you will sign up for the course. If you don't, I hope you'll stay engaged in this space. And um, thanks for your time. If you've got any questions, you want to get in touch or, or, but thank you. It's late on a Wednesday. <laughs>